Uh, welcome. Uh, thank you all for, uh, for coming. Uh, this is the uh, Zoom webinar on religion and the U.S. presidential election organized through the Public Humanities Hub of the University of British Columbia, co-sponsored by the Program in the Study of Religion and the Center for the Study of Democratic Institutions, both at UBC. Uh, I'm uh, Paul Quirk. I'm a professor of political science and a specialist uh, in American politics, uh, and I will be the moderator today. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge that UBC is on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. Religion has become a major factor in U.S. politics, uh, uh, has been for many years, but uh, in some new ways, uh, ver very important. Uh, one notable thing uh, is that uh, differences between the two political parties uh, and between the major ideological groupings are uh, highly uh, related to religion uh, nowadays. That is, people who attend religious services frequently uh, tend to be more Republican and more, uh, more uh, conservative, uh, although that's by no means a uniform uh, tendency. Uh, in the current uh, presidential campaign, there are really quite uh, interesting and important issues uh, uh, about religion. Uh, some have to do with how religious groups and their views uh, will affect the election and are affecting support for the different candidates. Uh, plus, there are uh, uh, undoubtedly very significant uh, aspects of um, issues about how the outcome of the election will affect uh, different religious groups, especially minority religious groups, uh, religious practice, and religious freedom. Uh, we have five really interesting presentations uh, today, uh, and they uh, re reflect a variety of perspectives uh, and issues. I'll just give you the uh, entire list of them right now. Leslie Paris from the Department of History will present on young adult voters, religion, and the culture wars. Richard Menkes, also from history, will present on anti-Semitism in the age of Trump. Sunera Thobani from Asian Studies will present on Islamophobia, the politics of hate in the US elections. Tony Ketty from Classical Near Eastern and Religious Studies will present on Trump, evangel Trump Evangelicals, the Bible and Christian nationalism. And finally, Sabina Magaliocho who is from anthropology and who is the director of the program in the study of religion, will present on magic and politics in the 2020 election. Each presenter will uh, present for about 10 minutes and we'll go through all of the presentations uh, and then we'll have uh, uh, time for uh, questions and answers. Uh, uh, and we will, uh, you'll be able to direct questions to any of the uh, present presenters. So let's begin. And uh, the first presenter is uh, Leslie on young adults, young adult voters, religion and culture wars. Terrific. Um, in recent years, the Pew Research Center has published a series of studies detailing Americans shifting religious affiliations. And one of the most striking features of these studies is the recent rise of the religiously unaffiliated or what the Pew pollsters call the nuns, meaning people who answer when asked their religion that they have none and who describe themselves as either atheists, agnostics, or of no particular faith. This number rose from 16% in 2007 to nearly 23% in 2014, growing to represent 56 million Americans and making the so-called nuns the second largest cohort just behind Christian evangelicals. While Christianity more broadly remains the dominant faith by far in the United States, with seven in 10 Americans identifying with the tradition, the ranks of professed Christians has been declining. To be clear, people with no declared religion have a wide range of spiritual practices and beliefs. The majority of so-called nuns actually describe themselves as believing in God and express a deep connection with nature and the earth. Over a third classify themselves as spiritual, if not religious, and one in five reports praying every day. 
But even though many of these respondents felt that religious institutions did good in their local communities, they also saw such institutions as overly concerned with money, power, rules, and politics, and said that they were not seeking out such institutions in their own lives. Who are the nuns? Statistically, they're more socially liberal, tend to vote for Democrats, support same-sex marriage and legal abortion, and they're more likely to be young. In one 2012 Pew survey, almost a third of adults under the age of 30 described themselves as religiously unaffiliated as compared to 9% of seniors age 65 and older. There's some debate about exactly what this generational divide will mean over time or even how significant it is. Some would argue that as generational cohorts settle down, have children, and become more rooted in communities, they generally turn toward institutional religious participation. According to this argument, the relative non-religiosity of a significant minority of young Americans is a temporary sign of their youth. Older millennials, for example, who are now in their late 30s, are more likely to be religiously affiliated than our younger millennials in their late 20s. On the other hand, in recent decades, increasing numbers of Americans grew up in a cultural climate less defined by regular participation in religious services and are less likely to have to report having attended such services weekly in their own childhoods. As a result, they may be less likely to return to these more traditional models in middle age. Moreover, the rate of religiously unaffiliated Americans has grown significantly in general over the past decades. From the 1970s to the early 1990s, the number of religiously unaffiliated adults remained below 10%. But just after the height of the culture wars of the 1980s, a rise in nuns became noticeable, right when today's cohort of young adults were young children. We're likely seeing a lasting cultural shift rather than a predictable but ephemeral expression of youthful indifference to organized religion. So how do the nuns matter in politics? Young people have not always been taken very seriously by politicians, in large part because the majority of young adults haven't been voting. Even in 2008, when the historic election of Barack Obama, the nation's first black president, energized many young voters, only 51% of Americans under the age of 30 went to the polls. And this was at a high point in youth voting over the past 50 years. Seniors, those age 65 and over, are far more reliable voters. It's no wonder that in the current 2020 presidential election, where the candidates are both septuagenarians themselves, there's been far much more focus on the senior vote than on that of young people. But the youth vote mattered in 2008, and it will likely matter in 2020. This year, despite Republican efforts to limit voting from gerrymandering districts to limiting advanced polling, mail-in voting, and the number of ballot boxes in contested districts, young people appear particularly energized to vote. In one recent national poll of young prospective voters, 63% claimed that they definitely would vote as compared to 47% in 2016. Of course, these plans can fall through, but young people have seen for themselves how government recklessness during a pandemic, as well as the unwillingness of the federal government to fully address a moment of racial reckoning affects their own lives, including their economic prospects, their ability to access education, their opportunities to see friends and relatives. As a racially diverse cohort, they're generally less moved by or openly averse to the calls to white supremacy that have taken place within the Trump campaign. And the fact that a significant minority of young adults are also nuns makes them less susceptible to an earlier generation's hot button culture war concerns. 
This list of concerns was developed first at the grassroots level and then as a matter of Republican policy in the 1970s and 1980s. Religious conservatives increasingly found a vocal home in the Republican Party, whose platform first included a plank opposing abortion rights and calling for a human life amendment to the US Constitution banning abortion in 1980. The Republican base, which is disproportionately white and religiously conservative, has also worked to limit or ban LGBTQ rights and feminist projects and lobbied to ban sex education and to offer a biblical alternative to the teaching of evolution in schools. All of these efforts were part of a, uh, the late 19th the late 20th century culture wars in which liberals seeking to expand on the rights revolution fought against conservatives who saw themselves as fighting moral decay. This conservative agenda has been remarkably successful in reshaping American political discourse. The Democratic Party also shifted rightward in the late 20th century. But in recent years, Republicans have been facing an electorate that's increasingly less likely to identify um, with some of these interests. The average viewer of Fox News, a staunch media ally of the Republican Party, is over 65 years old. In comparison, the CNN viewer is at least five years younger. The nation is increasingly racially diverse. Um, and uh, we can see that younger voters here, those under 35, overwhelmingly prefer um, Joe Biden. Um, only 52% of Generation Z, the cohort born after 1996, is white. President Trump's open appeals to white supremacy and his invocation to build a wall to keep out immigrants um, from the South are deeply unappealing to many younger voters. Even some younger religious conservatives report ambivalence about voting for Trump. Some say that their vote for the Republican Party is based on their support for an end to legal abortion, but that they are opposed to other Republican goals, such as a wall along the border with Mexico or to limits on LGBTQ rights. In other words, the culture wars of an earlier generation of religious conservatives don't resonate in exactly the same way with younger voters, even with those who are more religiously conservative. For example, members of the Church of Latter-day Saints, um, more popularly known as Mormons, and here um, I'm just putting up uh, a, uh, a slide here showing there is a certain amount of ambivalence even among um, uh, a variety of different kinds of Christian voters. Um, about Trump as a, as a president. Um, uh, even Mormons who have traditionally been a strong and consistent Republican voting bloc um, have stepped away from Trump. In 2016, 60% of Mormon millennials voted against Trump, though often for a third party um, Mormon candidate. One professor at Brigham Young University who recently polled several thousand of his former students found that three quarters of them, almost all of whom were practicing Mormons, said that they would not vote for Trump in 2020. And many of them sought to end the systemic racism that they associated with the current president. The rise of younger religiously unaffiliated voters is a further voting problem for Republicans. Nuns or people with no religious affiliation lean to the left politically just as white evangelicals tend to vote Republican. Americans aged 18 to 29 are much more likely to report being nuns and to say that Trump has been a terrible president. Although recent political events have been dispiriting to many progressive Americans, generational divides suggest that we may only be at the beginning of a major shift away from robust white evangelical influence in the United States. In the absence of a new evangelical religious revival or the mass movement of white 30-somethings back to church, we are looking at a major cultural shift with political implications. That is, if young people vote. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Leslie. Uh, and now to uh, Richard Minkus on anti-Semitism in the age of Trump, please. Today is a grim anniversary. Two years ago, a gunman entered Pittsburgh's Tree of Life Synagogue, 
home to three congregations, killing 11 worshipers and injuring six more. Six months later, another gunman entered a synagogue in Poway, California, killing one and injuring three before his gun jammed. They were, these were extreme but not isolated events. In its 2019 audit of anti-Semitic incidents, the Anti-Defamation League concluded that the American Jewish community had experienced the highest level of anti-Semitic incidents since the ADL had begun its tracking in 1979. These events have not just happened by coincidence in the last four years. The President of the United States has condoned, even promoted, the ideologies and behaviors that are most injurious to Jews and other minorities. We can start with conspiracy theories. Verbal or literary expressions of hostility can take a variety of forms, but at the far end of the spectrum are the expressions of deep enmity associated with conspiracy theories. In the Middle Ages, Jews were accused of being in alliance with the devil, sacrificing Christian children and using their blood in religious rituals. In the modern period, the accusations against Jews were secularized into updated conspiracy theories. Jews and Freemasons, for example, were perceived to be responsible for all the woes of modern life. In the early 20th century, the myth of a world Jewish conspiracy was popularized by the forged Protocols of the Elders of Zion, which purported to be the record of a meeting where Jews in charge of all the isms were bringing the world under their control. Historians of anti-Semitism have written about the dangerous impact of conspiracy theories. Norman Cohn called the protocols a warrant for genocide, inspiring some and dulling the moral sense of many others. More recently, historians have noted how the related myth of a Judeo-Bolshevik conspiracy easily crossed borders in interwar Europe, helped create a radical and dangerous other, and framed the outlook of many fascist regimes, including the Nazis. These conspiracy theories have also found a home in narrow-band American populist nationalism. The most notorious promoter in the interwar period was Henry Ford and his publication of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. He serialized it in 91 issues of his Dearborn Independent, which he distributed free in his dealerships, and he then reprinted them in, his publication, in the publication The International Jew. Even after his disavowal of the protocols, he kept the press, apparently thinking he might need it again, and supported two of the most virulent anti-Semites of the 1930s and 1940s, Father Coughlin and Gerald L. K. Smith. These conspiracy theories will change shapes, but not essences. In the past four years, we have seen some of the shape-shifting. At Charlottesville, there was an expression of the replacement libel, that the Jews are looking to replace white Americans with various racial minorities. The fabrications around George Soros, a Holocaust survivor and wealthy supporter of liberal causes, have been worldwide with no shortage of American applications. The most notorious conspiracy of the past few years, however, has been QAnon. The hatred of Soros is there, but the cabal or deep state has been presented as an all-powerful group of individuals, especially bankers, who are hell-bent on wealth and the performance of satanic rituals on children. Unlike other conspiracies, however, there is both a warning about the dangers, but the promise of a redeemer, namely Donald Trump, who is the only one capable of defeating the cabal. The anti-Semitic underpinnings of QAnon are hard to miss, drawing on the medieval blood libel and the modern protocols. The dangers of extremist conspiracy discourse become even greater if they are condoned or promoted by those with political power. A view held by a group of right-wing cranks in a bar is very different from views held by those in power. Of course, we know that a group of cranks can begin their ascent from a beer hall but all the more reasons to track the pathways to legitimization in the corridors of power. On October 2nd, 2020, the House of Representatives passed Resolution 1154, condemning QAnon and rejecting the conspiracy theory it promotes. The wording of its resolution included the following in its preliminaries. Whereas conspiracy theories have been a central driver of anti-Semitism for years, and QAnon conspiracy theories are fanning the flames as anti-Semitism is on the rise in the United States around the world, and et cetera, et cetera, then we therefore uh, propose the following legislation. The bipartisan support for the bill 
which suggest that QAnon uh, has indeed been perceived as anathema and dangerous. However, we must take note that 10% of the Republicans who participated in the vote voted against the motion, whereas all Democrats voted for it. This creeping in from the edges of the Republican Party can also be seen in tolerance for numerous QAnon supporters among Republican nominees for the primaries for the current elections. And some have indeed won those primaries and various news agencies, including CNN and Newsweek, have pointed to candidates to both Senate and the House who have ties to QAnon. And then there is Donald Trump. It seems he couldn't contain himself earlier this year at a Ford Motor plant in Michigan, calling out that Henry Ford, quote, that calling out about Henry Ford, quote, good bloodlines, good bloodlines. If you believe in that stuff, you've got good blood, end quote. While ignorance of Ford's political views is already hard to believe, Trump's comments about QAnon are both disingenuous and strategic. At the NBC town hall of the 15th of October, Trump stated, not for the first time, that he knows nothing about QAnon. But this time he was repeating it less than two weeks after a vote that had condemned it in the House of Representatives. Trump has made a calculation, and that calculation was that he will not dare alienate a group that holds wild conspiratorial theories with strong anti-Semitic resonance. It doesn't matter that at one point the White House did issue a statement on anti-Semitism when the president himself does not reject the ideologies and groups that hold on to conspiracy theories and represent the most dangerous discourse against Jews and other minorities. Because of the office he holds, he has made them mainstream. In addition to evaluating the discourse of anti-Semitism, we can also gauge the behaviors. One form of anti-Semitic behavior that found mainstream expression in the United States was social exclusion from clubs, universities, neighborhoods, and the like. But there have also been in the, American, in the American past recurrences of violent attacks against Jews, usually when treated as one of the enemies in the racial conflicts that are core to American history. In the late 19th century, marauding bands in the South beat Jewish store owners. In 1915, Leo Frank of Atlanta was, a, was convicted of raping and murdering a girl at the factory he managed. The evidence clearly pointed to his innocence, and so the governor commuted the death penalty to life imprisonment, but a mob disagreed and lynched him. The feelings unleashed by the Frank case, as well as the release of the movie Birth of a Nation, are key to understand the, the rebirth of the Ku Klux Klan on Atlanta's Stone Mountain. In that second iteration, the Klan broadened their attacks to include not just African Americans, but Jews and Catholics as well. Beginning in the 1950s, liberal Jews in the American South were targeted by white supremacists who rejected and feared the growing civil rights movement. In Atlanta, Rabbi Jacob Rothschild of the Reformed Temple had been an early and loud advocate of civil rights for African Americans, and on October 12, 1958, a bomb ripped through his temple, leading to extend, extensive damage, but no loss of life. Rabbi Perry Nussbaum, a reform rabbi serving in Jackson, Mississippi during the 60s, visited Freedom Riders in the in notorious Parchment Penitentiary, called on Southerners to reject the racism of their past, and wanted to see interracial gatherings in his newly constructed synagogue. In, 1967, in September 1967, members of the Klan bombed that synagogue, and two months later bombed his home. These white supremacist attacks against Jews were only a small fraction of what blacks and their churches suffered, but they are part of that phenomenon, part of that phenomenon. And this is the story that is playing out now. The Department of Homeland Security in its most recent Homeland Threat Assessment has warned that among domestic violent extremists, racially and ethnic, ethnically motivated violent extremists, uh, specifically white supremacist extremists, will remain the most persistent and lethal threat in the homeland. With slides for supporting statistics for the years 2018 to 2019. Current versions of white supremacist anti-Semitic screed were to be found in the rantings and writings of the attackers of the synagogues in Pittsburgh and Poa. The attacker in Pittsburgh, thoroughly radicalized by far-right ideologies and anti-Semitism online, 
saw the Me Mexican caravans as another Jewish inspired attempt to bring in quote unquote hostile invaders. As with conspiracy theories, proximity to power matters. Those in power should not just distance themselves from these violent white supremacists and members of ultra right wing militias, but should unequivocally denounce them. Trump's notorious remark about Charlottesville, that there were very fine people on both sides, quote unquote, was an early warning of his tolerance for violent extremists on the right. He has since tried to say that he was warned, referring to people who were there to quietly protest the removal of the statue of Robert Lee. But all reports of the time indicated that there was a rally, that this was a rally of white supremacists who were joined by heavily armed militia groups. During the pandemic, Trump tried to turn democratic states with lockdown orders into enemies and called for the liberation of states. And it was again armed militias that took the cue and showed up at rallies. While it is a curious feature of some contemporary alt-right wing, ultra right wing movements like the Proud Boys, that they are somewhat multiracial, there is no denying that they embrace violence. So when Joe Biden called on Trump in one of the debates to condemn Proud Boys, his response, Trump's response was Proud Boys, stand back and stand by. And this was another endorsement, clearly, of right-wing violence. From the time that I've been teaching courses in Jewish history for almost half a century, I have disavowed a view of Jewish history as one long period of relentless anti-Semitism. But there are times when anti-Semitism is real and grounded in history. Trump has legitimized the conspiracy theories and right-wing violent groups and has thus opened the White House gates to the worst enemies, to the worst elements of American racism and anti-Semitism. The Jewish community is suffering the consequences along with other minorities. In the three decades that I've been teaching courses on the Holocaust and on European fascism, I have also warned against facile comparisons between fascist regimes and contemporary politics. But there is no ignoring how Trump has been taking pages out of the fascist playbook, the big lies, cabals, and the threat of violence to delegitimize the democratic process. I can't help myself from mentioning, but that's for another talk. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Richard. Uh, next is uh, Sunira Thabani, Islamophobia, the Politics of Hate in the U.S. Elections. Thank you. Um, religion and race are front and center in the U.S. election, as my co-panelists have noted. Indeed, it would not be stretching the point too far to make the case that the hatreds associated with these categories are the grounds on which this election is largely unfolding and being fought out. Trump's talking of racist violence against Muslims, Black people, and migrants has been much commented upon, but it is striking how little attempt there has been to think through the intersection of race with religion, of their cross-cutting relations, of what I call their mutual constitution in contemporary US political culture. As I look at the anti-Muslim and anti-people of color rage in the US, so visible at the Trump rallies, it is notable that in the particular case of Islam, its presence is marked by Islamophobia, which is the hatred of Islam. In other words, Islam rarely appears through the lens of religion in this political field, but is hyper visible in the religious hatreds that have shaped this field itself. So I want to make here three main points. My first point is that Islamophobia was a key factor in the rise of the ultra-right populism that galvanized the political candidacy of Donald Trump in the 2016 election. And it remains crucial even now to the mobilization of his base in this election. Trump's message to his base is that Muslims are not only not American, their very presence is not to be tolerated. They are, quote, extremists, who come from, quote, jihadi regions, as he recently said of Congresswoman Ilhan Omar at a rally, send her back, chanted his supporters. Donald Trump's presidency became possible through just such a stoking of Islamophobia, which is now inseparable from the racial animus that's directed towards Muslims. 
Trump's run for the presidency was shaped by his fueling of the birther controversy, as has been well discuss discussed, the powerfully potent, if false, charge that President Obama was not only born outside the US, but was a closeted Muslim. This merging of racism, anti-Black racism, with anti-Islam fervor in the Bertha movement was also the means by which overtly white supremacist movements moved into the political mainstream. Trump wrote this religious racial hatred into the White House. Islam is now routinely, routinely treated as innate propensity of Muslims for barbaric cultural practices and misogynist hatreds. So deeply entrenched is this construct that it need not even be directly expressed anymore. In other words, of all the religions at play in the political field today, it is Islam that is present as an existential threat, global in scale, and apocalyptic in ambition. Moreover, Islam is demonized in the political sphere, not only by the right, but also from the left by the liberals as well as the feminists. Indeed, such hatred operates perhaps even more seductively in the discourses of human rights and sexual gender egalitarianism, of secularism, democracy, and freedom of expression, of sexual liberty and individual choice, discourses that are indispensable to neoliberal and postmodernizing worldviews and practices. Any public space available to Muslims is on condition they adhere to these westernizing worldviews, that they prove their goodness as Muslims by their subjugation to these values, unlike the bad Muslims who deserve to be expelled from the body politic. The second point of note is that this hatred of Muslims is an organized phenomenon. It is expressed collectively and works at the psychosocial level as well as at the level of political strategy. The routine association of Muslim presence with terrorism, misogyny, and homophobia in the media, in academic circles, in political spheres, produces Muslims as objects of hate, such that it becomes entirely reasonable that violence should become the modality of their governance. In this construction, the experiences and perspectives of heterogeneous, multilingual, multiracial Muslim communities recede into the background. Muslims cannot appear as historical subjects in such an environment. Any political resistance by Muslims is rendered illegible. It can only appear as hatred and hence as intolerable. Such production of the Muslim as embodiment of hatefulness is, of course, a technique of power. The ill will thus projected towards Muslims in this organized hatred is not purely or even primarily personal, even if it is experienced as such. Now, it's certainly true that the targeting of Muslims by the Trump administration has been opposed by many liberals, those on the left, feminists, but this opposition remains sporadic, and it is sparked by the resistance of Muslims themselves who stand up against the targeting of their communities. Such support remains contingent on good Muslim behavior, on condition that Muslims live up to westernizing norms. More to the point, this support has not translated into rethinking the place of Islam in the making of just possible futures. The support extended to Muslim communities remains largely on the basis also of confronting the racism directed at them, not on conf confronting the cultivation of hatred towards Islam, itself now racialized as a religion of terror. My third point is that this Islamophobia is a global phenomenon. It has become an organizing principle of global governance. Working productively as a regime of control, Islamophobia sanctions state as well as vigilante violence against Muslims in defense of the nation, the state, and a generic humanity. 
The global war made Islamophobia the condition for the making of national and transnational relations, international alliances and enmities, and intra-imperialist rivalry. This war remains ongoing, and Islamophobia continues to underpin the securitization and militarization of the neoliberal state as it extends corporate power well beyond that amassed through decades of privatization, deregulation, and political corruption. It has plunged the entire Middle East into further chaos, compounded the occupation of Palestine, and led to the pro proxy wars, coups, and counter-revolutionary movements, secular as well as Islamist, that enable US-backed regimes to re-fortify their authoritarian rule by squelching the liberatory possibilities within the region. In closing, we know that Islamophobia was already a multi-million dollar industry in the US in 2016. Its main objective was the promotion of hatred of Islam and Muslims. It has pushed legislation and changed curriculum to transform the political culture for the long term. Trump's political rhetoric presents an America besieged by Muslims who are closet terrorists, black people who rampage on the streets and burn down cities, migrants who are rapists and criminals, border crashing infants who deserve to be locked up in cages. With all this, Trump's support has fluctuated between 33 to 40% of the population. Whatever the result of the election, the Trump presidency has shifted the religio-racial discourses and white super supremacist politics in the US. Historically, Democrats have a poor record of contesting these politics. Trump has demonstrated how potent a path to political power are Islamophobia and anti-Muslim, anti-Black and anti-migrant racism. This lesson will outlast him as it will a possible Biden presidency. The recruitment by white supremacist hate groups of military personnel, police officers, law enforcement agencies, will also outlast the Trump presidency, as will the violence that is used by these hate groups in local communities to put people of color in their place. In closing then, does it matter who wins the election? Of course it does. It matters immensely. But will the religious racial conflicts escalated by the Trump administration in the US and around the world be de-escalated by a Biden victory at the polls? Only if movements for justice remain energized. We are all in for a rough ride, whatever the outcome of this US election. Thank you. Thank you, Samira. Uh, Tony Ketty, Trump Evangelicals, the Bible and Christian nationalism. Thanks, Paul. I uh, want to thank Mary Chapman and Heather Tam of the uh, Public Humanities Hub for all the work they've done in organizing this and uh, thank the other panelists for these already uh, very stimulating talks. All right. Uh, despite being fired from Fox News for sexual harassment, the conservative pundit Bill O'Reilly has written the most influential book on Jesus Christ in recent history. Killing Jesus, co-authored by sports writer Martin Dugard in 2013, is a New York Times bestseller and was turned into an award-nominated National Geographic film produced by none other than the esteemed filmmaker Sir Ridley Scott. Its impact is hard to overestimate. When Trump blasted through a crowd of peaceful Black Lives Matter protesters in DC to hold up a Bible for a photo in front of St. John's Episcopal Church, the Bible he held up might as well have been O'Reilly's. It was actually a family heirloom, which Trump's daughter Ivanka, a Jewish convert, stuffed into her purse for the photo op. Yet, in Trump's hands, displayed like a product for sale, this Christian Bible served as the sign of a profane covenant between Trump and his right-wing Christian supporters. These Trump evangelicals read the Bible through the same political lens as O'Reilly and the other leading figures of the Christian right. Killing Jesus is not the story of a first century Jewish peasant who preached about loving neighbors and enemies and told the rich to give their possessions to the poor to get into heaven. No, 
It is the tale of a working class Galilean who was killed for rising up to advocate for individual liberties in a world ruled by greedy, ritual obsessed collectivist Jews and Romans. The book smacks of a type of anti Semitic biblical interpretation. Uh, that has its roots in representations of Jesus as Aryan by European nationalists like Ernest Renan in the 19th century. O'Reilly's book casts Jesus as a pious, family-oriented, bootstrapping Christian from the rural heartland of Galilee, whose prosperity was impeded only by taxes and regulations, that is, by a big government centered in the liberal urban metropolis of Jerusalem. O'Reilly and Dugard present these dangerous, tendentious interpretations as history. Their book is infused with the racial and economic resentment politics typical of the Tea Party movement that paved the way for Trump's campaign and remain prevalent today. But as I argue in my book, Republican Jesus, sorry for the plug, these interpretations surface at an earlier moment in American history, namely in the conservative reaction to FDR's New Deal. In his 1933 inauguration speech, FDR tried to settle anxieties about his sweeping New Deal policies aimed at pulling America out of the depression by creating jobs and a social safety net. FDR used a biblical metaphor he would repeat time and again. He condemned the big bankers as the quote, money changers who have fled from their high seats in the temple of our civilization. He interpreted Jesus' fatal confrontation with the money changers in the Gospels so that Jesus' message of economic reform represented FDR's New Deal. And the corruption of the money changers was akin to the self-interested practices of the wealthy bankers and corporate executives FDR blamed for causing the Depression. Before long, there was a backlash from big bankers and corporate leaders. By 1940, corporate lobbyists had sponsored the eff efforts of Reverend James Fifield, dubbed Apostle to the Millionaires by critics. With substantial corporate funding, Fifield created a widely influential organization called Spiritual Mobilization. It presented an individualist interpretation of Jesus' teachings as, quote, the only antidote to the New Deal's virus of collectivism. According to Feefield and his network of ministers, the Bible's most important message is thou shalt not steal, which means that the government should not steal taxes from the rich to support the lazy poor, where the lazy poor is, of course, also a racialized category and in uh, the Reagan era in particular would be associated with the uh, representation, toxic representation of uh, the welfare queen. Feefield defined the New Deal as pagan statism, and his network was quick to conflate it with all forms of socialism and communism at home and abroad, including fascism and Nazism. Liberal Christians, such as the left-leaning National Council of Churches, were placed under this umbrella category of pagan statism. This anti-New Deal interpretation of Jesus as a prophet of unfettered free market capitalism endures in interpretations like O'Reilly and Dugard's, where Jesus' confrontation with the money changers is an indictment of big government, not corporate corruption. During and after World War II, the emergent Christian rights gospel of small government took on militaristic overtones. In the heyday of Christian nationalism, during the Eisenhower presidency in the 50s, conservative influencers emphasized that Jesus' gospel of small government must be imparted on the communist world. Billy Graham, America's most prominent preacher, promoted every war during his lifetime and did so as an opportunity to bring salvific Christian capitalism to pagan communists. Graham also joined with leaders of the Christian right who opposed civil rights as pagan government interference in the affairs of Christian individuals. And once conservative evangelicals started to oppose abortion, they traded the earlier Catholic pro-life script in which big government should protect the unborn for the claim that unborn citizens' rights must be protected from big government. I present this snapshot of the history of modern right-wing interpretations of Jesus because when Trump holds up that Bible, he invokes the Christian right's distinctive understanding of the Bible as a charter for free market capitalism, small government, and authoritarianism. In other words, this Bible is a symbol of what scholars have called Christian nationalism. 
Sociologists Andrew Whitehead and Samuel Perry have argued that Christian nationalism is, quote, a cultural framework, a collection of myths, traditions, symbols, and value systems that idealizes and advocates a fusion of Christianity with American civil life. Christian nationalists think that America was founded as, and should remain, a Christian nation. Hence the new variants on MAGA hats with the slogan, Make America Godly Again, and the proliferation of Jesus 2020 products. Whitehead and Perry have demonstrated that about 20% of Americans, an overwhelmingly white group, are what they call ambassadors of Christian nationalism. Another 32% are what they call accommodators, people who think Christian values should influence government, but are willing to admit that non-Christians might express these values. On the basis of recent national survey data, Whitehead and Perry have shown that Christian nationalism includes assumptions of nativism, white supremacy, patriarchy, heteronormativity, and divine sanction for authoritarian control and militarism. One of the paradoxes of Christian nationalism is that the Christian right advocates freedom from government taxes and regulations, often through a rhetoric of religious liberty, yet they're inclined to support militaristic authoritarianism. This makes perfect sense, though, if one point is acknowledged, that the individual freedoms that the Christian right champions are only freedoms for the chosen, the privileged, the McCloskeys. The government is expected to intervene only in cases in which the specific privileges of the predominantly white Christian right are at stake. Pro-Trump Christians want the government to act to protect their freedoms at the expense of others, to protect their individual religious freedom to spread COVID through worship instead of abiding by government regulations, to have ICE officers protect them from Mexicans taking their jobs, to have police protect their individual liberties from Black Lives Matter protesters looting their commodities and stealing their taxes. Trump is delivering on his promise to protect Christian, Christian, his Christian supporters' privileges. In his 2016 speech to a Christian audience, in which he said he could stand in the middle of Fifth Avenue and shoot somebody and not lose any voters, he went on to say, Christianity is under tremendous siege, whether we want to talk about it or we don't. Christianity will have power. If I'm there, you're going to have plenty of power. You don't need anybody else. You're going to have somebody representing you very, very well. Remember that. Trump persuaded right-wing Christians with his art of the deal. The Bible Trump flashed before St. John's was a reminder of that covenant. In 2016, 81% of white evangelicals voted for Trump and they are likely to do so again so is a significant proportion of white Catholics and white mainline Protestants. The twice-divorced celebrity president who paid off a porn star, brags about sexually assaulting women, mocks people with disabilities, doesn't go to church or read the Bible, used to support abortion, isn't subtle about his racism, valorizes wealth, and the list goes on, clashes, of course, with the performative morality of many conservative Christians. But it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because he has proven through his Supreme Court picks and executive orders that he'll work to keep his white evangelical base the ambassadors of Christian nationalism in power. What remains to be seen is whether he can capture enough votes of accommodators of Christian nationalism, many of whom are African American. Trump's evangelical advisors are actively courting black, accommoda black accommodators of Christian nationalism by trying to displace the national discussion about racism with rhetoric about Democrats, today's pagan statists, attacking Christianity. Dems want to shut your churches down, Trump tweeted. Biden, he warns, will hurt the Bible, hurt God. We need to stand up against the Christian right's attempts at cornering Christianity. In addition to donating to and voting for candidates who resist the American Christian right, if you're able, I urge anybody who cares about inclusion and social justice to amplify the voices of survivors of the repressive culture of right-wing Christianity and to support the efforts of progressive Christian and interfaith movements like the Poor People's Campaign, a movement against poverty, systemic racism, ecological devastation, militarism, and the other trappings of Christian nationalism that has Muslim and Jewish support. In this crucial last week before the election, critics of the Christian right across the world 
regardless of religious inclination, should raise up the voices of those for whom the Bible is not a weapon, prop, and tool of exclusion, but instead an invitation to critical reflection and radical inclusivity. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Tony. Uh, next is uh, Sabina Manyoko, uh, Magic and Politics in the 2020 Election. One of the most surprising cultural phenomena to emerge from the election of Donald J. Trump to the presidency of the United States in 2016 has been the open public use of magic in the service of politics by a small but significant contingent of the American population. By magic, I mean ritual practices intended to influence the outcome of external events, whether in a secular or religious context. My presentation today will examine a range of contemporary American magical responses to the upcoming election. Taken together, they provide data from the entire political spectrum from the far right to the hard left, illustrating new intersections of magic and politics in the United States in the first quarter of the new millennium. Now, we often associate magic with historical or non-Western cultural contexts, but this is a mistake because there is a robust history of political magic in the West going all the way back documented to Roman times, but certainly also in the modern age, beginning in the 18th century with the involvement of Rosicrucians in political magic. And magic is used in connection to politics in many contemporary global contexts. However, relatively little uh, scholarship has dealt with this phenomenon in a North American context. The term magic can be both contentious and ambiguous. Historical scholarship attempted to sharply distinguish magic from religion, categorizing magic either as primitive, erroneous practices limited to colonized or marginalized cultures, or as secretive practices whose aims were at odds with a broader social good. But in the middle of the 20th century, anthropologists critiqued these distinctions, arguing that since both magic and religion use ritual to maintain relations with an invisible world of spirits, the line dividing them is, by definition, arbitrary. I'm defining magic here as an essentially religious phenomenon, following the approach of anthropologist Clifford Geertz, who defined religion as a cultural system that provides a system of symbols which acts to establish powerful, pervasive, long-lasting moods and motivations in humans by formulating conceptions of a general order of existence and clothing these conceptions in such an aura of factuality that the moods and motivations seem uniquely realistic. Thus, acts that practitioners call magic, such as the Pepe the Frog cult of Kek meme magic appropriated by the alt-right, as well as acts that practitioners view as being religious in nature, such as Pastor Frank Amidia's POTUS shield, a form of spiritual prayer protection for President Trump, both fall under the rubric of religious behavior. But while prayer is a form of action that falls squarely into mainstream concepts of religion, magic does not. Drawing on a Durkheimian legacy, magical acts and technologies have usually been relegated to the categories of occultism or esotericism, reproducing the presumption of magic as secretive, exclusionary, and fundamentally antisocial. I'm going to take issue with that categorization, showing how magic works to create communities and political coalitions in a digital age. Most communities practicing political magic today have a robust internet presence, and some exist exclusively online. Now, the internet and social media do not in and of themselves cause political magic to erupt, but as means of communication, they accelerate both the rate and the scope of diffusion, reaching much larger audiences much faster than pre-electronic means of communication. In some cases, the effects can cause what began as practices limited to small communities to spread outside those groups. A much more common effect of the internet and social media uh, have been the increasing fragmentation of communities into echo chambers, sharing identical norms, values, and opinions, and the consequent polarization of society. This effect is visible along the entire political spectrum, but is especially marked in the case of the emergence of the right of right-wing religious extremism. So uh, here I show you some symbols associated with uh, the cult of Keck, uh, and the and Pepe the Frog. Pepe the Frog is this frog uh, meme, this frog icon, uh, which originated in a comic by Matt Fury in 2005 and was picked up by the alt-right on the internet message boards 
4chan and 8chan around 2015. Originally, Pepe the Frog was associated with a white male bro culture, but it became more broadly linked to misogyny, xenophobia, and racism. The term kek to talk about this frog-like uh, creature and to associate him with the Egyptian god kek uh, comes from the world of warfare um, role, uh, online role-playing game. Uh, where the messages of the opposition of the uh, team that is opposing you are reproduced in code and the internet um, expression LOL, meaning laugh out loud, is rendered K-E-K, -E so kek. When it was discovered by um, people on 4chan and 8chan that kek was also an ancient Egyptian frog-headed god of chaos and darkness. The discovery of this coincidence led to the creation of a satirical new religion dubbed the cult of kek on these message boards. Uh, and to Kekistan, the fictional nation in which kek rules, or the fictional uh, realm that um, followers of kek want to bring about. You see, the flag of Kekistan clearly echoes both the Nazi flag and the symbols of the KKK. The purpose of this new religion was basically trolling liberals and making fun of political correctness. Because the religion is tongue-in-cheek, it maintains plausible deniability. Were any offended liberals to take issue with it, they would be even more vehemently mocked for taking seriously a, a fictitious and satirical uh, religion. The belief emerged around 2016 that reposting the frog meme would magically bring about the election of Trump to the presidency. Trump's ascendancy was viewed as a needed restorative, which would liberate white men from the oppressiveness of political correctness, but more broadly, bring about chaos, darkness, and the collapse of liberal democracy in order to restore Aryan supremacy. So predictably, there is a counter movement. The Women's International Terrorist Conspiracy from Hell, acronym WITCH, whose members you see here in this slide protesting um, at a Black Lives Matter rally, I believe earlier this year, emerged as a tongue-in-cheek branch of the feminist movement in the late 1960s. Uh, it protested in favor of women's rights, against the Vietnam War, uh, and for other liberal causes such as environmentalism. The movement died down and disappeared in the 1970s, but it reemerged in 2017 at the Women's March that followed the presidential inauguration. WITCH represented women's rage at the defeat of Hillary Rodham Clinton by a misogynistic president who had openly admitted to committing sexual assault. And it also represented rage at other kinds of uh, political um, aims that the Trump administration embraced right from the beginning. Aims that attacked women's autonomy, women's rights, uh, the environment, uh, and other liberal causes. The witch emerged as a figure of resistance. Now, generally speaking, in societies that have a belief in witchcraft, the witch is represented as the opposite of right society. But if right society equals white nationalism, then the opposite of right society includes all of the ideals that counter that. Witchcraft also in this context represents the power of women against the patriarchy, the fecundity that comes from women's culture, from women's uh, bodies as a kind of ternarian anti-structure uh, and the source of art, music, literature, and other revitalization movements. Witches generally work from the margins. So, W-A-T-C-H works from the margins, from the shadows, but it is also very public in terms of working uh, as protests and as part of political theater. Started by a, a Washington DC based attorney who identifies as a witch and calls herself Hecate Demeter is the magical battle for America. This movement is based on Dion Fortune's Magical Battle of Britain, which took place between 1939 and 1944, and whose aim was to prevent Hitler from invading Great Britain. This movement is grounded in the idea that many people working together and sharing a vision and feeling great passion can influence the will of the American people as a whole. 
It uses an internet-based series of guided meditations based on easily recognizable American icons that generate strong emotions. Symbols such as the Statue of Liberty, the United States flag, the Great Plains, the bison, the cowboy, the salmon of the Pacific Northwest, and others. Practitioners work individually but synchronously at the same time, envisioning the symbols, imagining them uh, as protecting and strengthening US democracy, democracy in particular, not the, not the American government uh, as a whole. Most participants in the Magical Battle for America are also heavily engaged politically. The kind of interchange that occurs on uh, Hecate Demeter's blog, The Magical Battle for America, shows that these largely, uh, predominantly female participants are actively involved in voter registration, postcard writing campaigns, canvassing for Democratic candidates, donating to Democratic and anti-racist causes, uh, and other things that we associate with the liberal left. Probably the best known form of magical resistance uh, emerged in uh, February of 2017, and it is the movement to bind Trump and all those who aid and abet him. It was started by a Baltimore magician and author named Michael Hughes, uh, largely as a cathartic exercise in his own backyard. He wrote about it in an article published on Medium, and the spell that he wrote went viral. Hundreds joined him synchronously in binding Trump to prevent him and all those who aid and abet him from harming the American Republic and democracy and all of its victims. At first, Hugh's audience was presumed to be other pagans, witches, and other contemporary magical practitioners. But a surprising thing happened. The spell jumped the boundaries by appealing to non-magical folks. Many people who didn't identify as one of these religious minorities uh, jumped on board and decided that they wanted to participate in binding Trump as well. Like the magical battle for America, the binders work synchronously online on a dark moon. The spells and the dates of the spells are announced on social media. There's a Facebook page currently at over 5,000 members where members post their personal experiences, photographs of the altars of their bindings, uh, and uh, generally uh, other kinds of politically motivated uh, posts that encourage people to participate. Bind Trump now has its own sigil, which is marketed on t-shirts, stickers, and other merchandise. Now, predictably, the bind Trump magic resistance has only inflamed further the passions of those on the evangelical right wing who see this and other magical movements as proof positive of the need to counter the satanic opposition to Trump's presidency. Among a substantial number of evangelical Protestant Christians in the United States, prophecies arose around 2016 alleging that God had chosen Donald Trump to lead the United States as part of a divine plan to bring about the kingdom of God on earth. Trump's character flaws, which are actually kind of anti-Christian, were taken as actual signs that he is God's chosen since God would choose an unexpected person to be his messenger. These Christians share evangelism and a millenarian messianic eschatology in which the United States is divinely mandated to spread the gospel throughout the globe. They embrace a dualistic view of a cosmic struggle between God and Satan for control of the world in which conspiracy theories and evil plots to subvert God's plan play key roles. Um, in this worldview, the left and everything it stands for are the personifications of evil, while the right, with Trump as its leader, is literally acting at the direction of God. From this mix of conspiracy theories and eschatology emerges spiritual warfare, a cluster of techniques involving prayer and gifts of the spirit, speaking in tongues, healing, and prophecy, all aimed at protecting the 45th president from his enemies, and therefore God's enemies. The foremost among these is Pastor Frank Amerius's POTUS Shield, an internet-based synchronous form of collective prayer. And as in these other examples, practitioners work synchronously but separately. They work online. Uh, they pray at the same time to create a shield of prayer 
around the president that is supposed to repel the magical onslaught of his enemies. Now, there are a number of common threads to these magical practices. First of all, we see that they exist largely as online communities. The workings are synchronous. People work individually but separately um, at the same time. Uh, they create a sort of effective networking. They create connections. They connect people through strong emotions and by forming identities that are oppositional to something else. In the case of um, white nationalists, they are oppositional to what they see as forces inimical to white nationalism, such as liberal democracy. In the case of witches, uh, the forces of white supremacy and white nationalism are seen as inimical. The rituals that they do create collective effervescence. They unite communities around shared experiences and can lead to the emergence of new religions or religious phenomena and charismatic leaders. Finally, we should ask ourselves, why magic now? Why is magic emerging now as a technology under these particular circumstances? Magic typically emerges among groups who feel disenfranchised. And we see that, for example, the cult of Keck magic emerged among white males who feel that somehow uh, they are losing privilege, even though they are objectively the most privileged group in society. But the gains through the civil rights movement, through the women's rights movement, the movement uh, for rights of LGBTQ plus plus individuals, um, all kinds of civil rights movements have threatened uh, their supremacy, and therefore they feel besieged. Christians, similarly, although they are the predominant religion in the United States, feel besieged and disenfranchised by the emergence of significant minorities who are either um, spiritual but not religious, belong to the nuns that Leslie spoke about before, or who are Jewish, Muslim, uh, or belong to other minority religions in the United States. Women feel disenfranchised by a president who openly speaks about sexually assaulting women with impunity and who is engaged in a process to remove their rights of autonomy over their own bodies and over their own decision-making processes. And of course, Wiccans, pagans, and magical practitioners as members of very tiny religious minorities in the United States uh, feel disenfranchised kind of by definition. Magic also addresses in situations of high stakes and high anxiety. The coming presidential election feels like a high stakes and high anxiety situation for both extremes, for, for, for anyone, I think, in the United States right now, for both the, ex the, the extreme right, the alt-right, and for uh, people on the left. This really feels like the election of their lives. And so it is predictable that magic would emerge as a technology to address these issues. Uh, it hinges on issues that threaten identity, that threaten existence, and ultimately threaten life itself. Thank you very much, Sabina. So we uh, now have uh, about uh, 15 to 18 minutes or so available for uh, questions and answers from the audience. Uh, and let me say that I will uh, encourage the uh, panelists to uh, deal with questions sort of one at, one at a time that is uh, basically one panelist will address uh, one question so we can get more questions rather than having a, a lot of conversation about a few questions. Uh, we have one uh, question uh, to begin with and it is uh, from uh, someone whose name is, uh, looks to me like Vita Jogolis or Jogoli. Uh, and it is addressed to uh, Richard about the anti-Semitism. The question is, uh, given Trump's anti-Semitism, I'm puzzled by the quarter of American Jews that support him. How do you explain this? I'm puzzled too. I mean, it's, 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 uh, it's quite simple. Um, uh, I think that there are those, uh, there has historically been a group of Jews who have, um, who have who have perceived the election through ostensibly what is good for what they could what they think is good for Israel, um, and and they seem to think that uh, that that's what Trump is. Many others would disagree, um, and um, and there also seem to be people who think that 
just as everybody who criticizes Israel is an anti-Semite, that everybody who's for Israel must be a philo-Semite, which is, which is completely specious. I mean, some of the things that Trump has said when he's talked about Israel have suggested that he subscribes to a, a view of, uh, of dual loyalty, that, you know, Israel is your country, Netanyahu is your, is your leader. So um, it, is, it is puzzling. Um, it's not unusual. But um, uh, yeah, uh, I think that some people have a very narrow band by which they decide uh, these matters. Thank you, Richard. Uh, next question is uh, for, uh, from uh, someone whose full name is not there. It looks like the last name might be Ferris, and it's uh, directed to uh, Sabina. Uh, I understand that magic may feel like a way to participate or to express agency for establishing a different world. However, isn't relying on magic more about escaping the hard work that needs to take place to actually make change happen? Right, thank you for that question. That is a common way of looking at magic, but in effect, we need to look and see how these magical communities work. First of all, as I mentioned in particularly my look at uh, magic on the left, these communities work to strengthen people's commitment to a cause and to encourage them to become involved in politics by canvassing, calling their candidates, uh, engaging in letter writing campaigns, uh, engaging in efforts to get out the vote and so on and so forth. So these, these communities function, I think, particularly on the left more to galvanize people to get out and work in the real world than to simply wave a magic wand and expect results. The second part of this is that um, I think that there's a misunderstanding in terms of how much work magic actually is. Magic is a lot of work. If you're going to do things magically, it involves raising a tremendous amount of energy. It involves assembling a lot of ritual um, accoutrements. It, it involves a tremendous concentration of will and physical energy. And so the, the amount of energy that magicians put into magical workings or that WITCH puts into getting the costumes together, uh, putting together their signs, going to protests day after day after day, providing food and other um, uh, sustenance, water for other protesters. I mean, th these things involve a lot of work. They're not, it's not a popular view of magic the way that you might see on Harry Potter or, or in uh, popular representations where you wave a wand and say a few words. Uh, this is the concentration of will and energy towards a particular cause. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm going to uh, take a question from uh, Tarina Mailer. Uh, and um, that is, she directs it to uh, any of the panelists, but I think I'm going to ask uh, both uh, Tony uh, and uh, Laura to uh, consider this one. Uh, there appears, the question is, there appears to me to be a lack of logic around pro-Trump beliefs, a lack of coherent rationale. Do any of the panelists have comments around this? Uh, Professor Paris, I'm forgetting your first name for some reason right now, and Tony. It's Leslie, that's fine. Thanks, sorry. Oh, no worries. I got the, got the first letter correct. <laughs> you did. Um, I'll just say really briefly, that's a good question. Thank you for that. Um, and that I think uh, that part of the appeal of Trump is very much uh, at an emotional register. Um, he appeals to people who are feeling fearful and anxious about um, losses that they feel they're experiencing in the world, about globalization, about their place in racial hierarchy, about um, the place of religion in the world. Um, he, um, uh, he taps into some pretty primal feelings um, and uh, and then some of his supporters will bend themselves into pretzel shapes to, um, to find ways of explaining why someone whose um, behavior has been uh, so troubled and dubious um, uh, is, is worthy of, a, um, of the mantle they want to give him. So I think the appeal is at the, at the heart is a very 
emotional one first and then is later rationalized. Tony, I don't know what you would, you would say. Let, about me, let me amend the question to Tony a, a little bit to sort of specify it for his, for his focus. I'm wondering whether you think that the, uh, that the uh, support of uh, Christian evangelicals uh, for Trump uh, reflects on the part of the, the, um, you know, the membership, the ordinary people, um, some sort of conscious prioritization of the issue, you know, the practical issues about appointing judges or uh, abortion on the one hand, or actually uh, very pervasive misinformation about uh, Trump's uh, conduct and uh, you know, and the, a lot of the issues were l l the features of his conduct that are in conflict with with religious belief. So there's a, a great deal of lying about uh, whether he has committed sexual assault and uh, you know, whether he attends church and all these matters. Do you have any sense of of that? This is kind of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that, that's a great yeah. question. I, you know, I, yeah. I would echo everything that Leslie was saying uh, before in, in response to this, uh, too. Um, yeah, the uh, there have been some polls, uh, Gallup polls, I think, uh, that have suggested that there are there certainly are some evangelicals who do uh, buy into the misinformation that Trump is and a moral and upstanding person. They'll answer questions. Is Trump a moral and upstanding question, uh, person? Yes. This is a small minority of them, though. I really do think that the that the instrumentalist view of of Trump, the um, the ways that he will, you know, sign these executive orders that often are actually quite impotent, um, but make it seem like, uh, you know, he's uh, s supporting specific religious liberties and the Supreme Court justices that he is appointing. I think they are, uh, you know, the main uh, some of the main. Um, reasons for evangelical uh, and uh, right-wing Christian support for Trump. That being said, on the issue of his um, personality, of his morality, his personal morality, I I think that, you know, like like Leslie was saying about the kind of a shape, uh, you know, kind of pretzel twisting that we see, um, I think one of the most popular views, uh, using the Bible at least, that has come about to explain Trump, and he feeds into it, but it's being um, it created, generated mainly by the his evangelical advisory board. He has assembled people around him to to be his information campaign. Really, um, is the the Cyrus theory the idea that Trump is like Cyrus, uh, the Persian king who uh, ended the Babylonian exile, uh, restoring God's people to uh, you know to their former glory, um, and it, Cyrus is an outsider, and he's an outsider who is expected to you know, uh, restore God's people, you know, in Israel in the Bible, but, you know, Christians or American Christians in uh, modern uh, representations. Um, he's, he does so by subduing nations. He uses militaristic force. He's an outsider who's understood as a pagan. It does, so it's plausible deniability. It sort of doesn't matter what he does, so long as the ultimate end goal is in place. And that's, that's why I've emphasized the kind of power uh, language that we see. I, I, I do think that a lot of people are very attracted to that, that end game. Thank you. Um, I have a question also, if, it's, uh, if I may be permitted, uh, of Sunera, and that would be, uh, uh, if you could comment a little bit on uh, uh, Muslims on the sort of agency side of this uh, this election, I think most of your most of your interest, uh, understandably, has been about how uh, developments in American politics in this election are affecting uh, Muslims. But could you say a bit about uh, the degree to which uh, there is an activism? Uh, and uh, you know, organization and significant mobilization of uh, Muslim Americans in the election and what effect they might be having. Uh, thanks. Yeah, well, thank you for the question. I think that there is a, a huge um, kind of energizing um, effect that Trump's uh, presidency has had on Muslim communities in the U.S. Um, there is tremendous energy around getting the community out to vote. I think we've seen, you know, the emergence of Rashida Tlaib, of Ilhan Omar, that kind of political activism, a kind of long-term vision 
for creating this political space for Muslims is certainly there. And there is a lot of support for that in Muslim communities. But you know, this idea about, uh, and I'll just go back to the previous question about you know, what is the logic around Trump? And I think that there is a really clear logic around Trump. This is part of the counter revolution against the civil rights movements. This is part of the counter revolution, not only again of, against the gains that people of color have made in the US since the Second World War, but it's also part of the you know, role of the state in regulating corporations, in environmental protection. Like there is an organized, funded body that has been planning this counter revolution from the 1950s on. And Trump is in a way, I mean, they might have had to hold their nose to you know, keep him in power, bring him in power and keep him in power. But there is this organized counter revolution. And I think it's really important for us to understand that if we take a kind of long-term view of, uh, of how Trump has been able to more mobilize, but also what continues to keep him in power. Um, so I, you know, I, I think, so we do need to rethink kind of US history in a much longer term context here to understand the phenomena of Trump. And in terms of Islamophobia, there is also a logic. I mean, it, the Islamophobia of uh, the Bush administration, of the Obama administration, and now of the Trump administration, there is a continuity there. And part of you know, Trump's escalation of Islamophobia and racism is I think to do with the, the defeats of the US in Afghanistan, in Iraq. And that's also part of the frustration, this rage from Trump's base, that despite all of the military, cultural might of the United States and the coalition that it put together, it was not able to defeat uh, uh, the movements was not able to bring Afghanistan, Iraq under control. And I think that that's also part of the, the kind of, you know, frustration and the logic around the escalation of the Islamophobia. Uh, thank you. Uh, we're, uh, we're about one minute from the end of our scheduled time. And uh, that I think is uh, just enough for me to say that I, I have found uh, these presentations uh, extremely interesting and simulating. I, I have uh, questions from the audience that I will not be able to get to, and I apologize to those audience members uh, for that. But um, I think uh, I, I can suppose that we all thank the panelists very much for their pr presentations. And that will conclude our activities for the afternoon. Thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.